All right, my name is Sean. I'm with North Branch Nature Center. Thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Also, thanks to Green Mountain Audubon Society for uh, putting this on with us. It's really uh, awesome to be able to collaborate on all these great um, bird uh, webinars and presentations uh, this season. So um, if you've missed some of our other programs uh, this spring or really over the last year, we can always go to northbranchnaturecenter.org slash presentations and get recordings of um, everything we've done over the last year. Um, and if for whatever reason your technology um, you know, fails on you tonight or you get kicked off or whatever, um, you'll be able to check out this, the recording of this presentation uh, either tomorrow or the next day up at northbranchnaturecenter.org slash presentations. Um, a couple of uh, quick things I thought would be relevant to this particular audience to let you know about. Um, one is uh, we're in the season of Friday morning bird walks over at North Branch Nature Center. Um, so feel free to join us at, uh, actually it's different locations each week, but throughout the month of May, um, Friday mornings at seven o'clock, uh, join us for bird walks. You can head over to our website and look at the event calendar to see where we're gonna be. Um, also wanted to mention that we have an upcoming, upcoming um, uh, weekend long biodiversity university course, uh, slow birding with with Bridget Butler coming up on uh, May 29th and 30th. So if you'd really like an intensive weekend uh, full of, of birds and, and learning about birds in some new ways, I encourage folks to check out the, um, uh, this program coming up, Slow Birding with Bridget Butler, May 29th and 30th. Um, all right, so in terms of uh, tonight, um, folks, if you have any questions as we go, please feel free to put them into the chat and those will come directly to me. Um, if you're given the option of whether you want to send a question to Larry or send it to me, or send it, which is, you know, I'll be listed as North Branch Nature Center, send it to North Branch Nature Center um, as your option. And, uh, and we'll probably hold the questions, most of them, until the end. Um, but if you send me a question, we'll make sure we get to it. Um, so uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome Larry back to North Branch Nature Center after a hiatus uh, where he went away and got a PhD in computer science and is now putting that to good work uh, in, in wildlife monitoring. Um, Larry is formerly a teacher and naturalist um, at uh, the Nature Center and actually taught me a lot of what I know about birds um, back when I was a teenager. So it's really a pleasure to kind of come around and finally have an opportunity to get together and, and, uh, and learn together again this evening. Um, so uh, without further ado, Larry, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sean. Yeah, it's it's so great to be back here. Um, I want to start by just giving a shout out to uh, Green Mountain Audubon Society and North Branch Nature Center for hosting this event and for allowing me this platform to share uh, my passion with all of you. Um, these organizations just do so much incredible work uh, promoting, um, you know, a love of nature in our community. And, and that is, honestly, if you're a, conser a conservation minded person, that is our first line of defense um, against, um, you know, all of the harms that are happening to to our planet and the natural world is, is getting people connected with nature. So if you're not a member of one of these organizations or both of them, I encourage you to, to support them. So with that, let's dive straight in. Um, so we did a little poll at the beginning. I'm gonna repeat the question in case you, you came on a little bit later, but I asked people to put in the chat, yes, if you've seen a bird flying across the face of the moon um, in person in real life and a no if you haven't, and it was looking like our unofficial, <laughs> unscientific uh, synopsis that it was you know, very heavily in the no camp. And you know, hopefully that will change in the future. And for me, about a year ago, that, that was true too. And it's okay, you know, it's okay not to have experienced this nocturnal migration tangibly yet. Um, we are all diurnally biased, right? Um, our biological imperative really tells us that you know this is a time where. We should, we should get our rest, but there is just so much that happens at night um, that really is hidden, cloaked by darkness. And what we're gonna do today is illuminate this incredible mass migration of birds and, and discuss it in, in a couple different aspects. And so um, I think what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm gonna do another pause. I'm gonna try to throw a little bit of interactivity um, into this talk here and there. Um, so obviously now, if you didn't know previously, you know now that birds, many of them migrate at night. Um, I'm gonna ask pe people to put into the chat, why do you think birds migrate at night? Um, I'm not gonna do this super often because I think it'll slow down the pace, but let's start off with, with you just, you know, churning your, your brain a little bit. If you don't know already, um, try to think of what reasons, what incentives might there be for a bird to migrate at night when it's a bird that presumably is normally awake during the daytime. And Sean, maybe you can help us out and, 
and um, recap some of the responses that are that are landing there in the chat. We have avoid predators, avoid predators, avoid predators, predators, raptors, predators, <laughs> safety, less wind, less weather problems. It's cooler and safer, uh, less human activity. Uh, the stars are visible. <laughs> well, this, is, this is great. I, I've said it once, I'll say it again. People who go to North Branch and Green Mountain Audubon Society talks are very smart people. Um, <laughs> so let me try to advance my slide here. Um, oh, so I guess I guess we'll reveal the answer to that. And if you if you have more guesses, you can put them into the chat now while I go over the overview. We're going to start by just doing a brief intro, which is basically going to be answering that question. You know, why are, are birds migrating? We'll talk a little bit about how, how many of them are mi migrating by night. Um, then we're going to talk about a few of the ways that uh, people have observed this phenomenon and, and studied it. Because, you know, really the big challenge is it happens at night. It's, it's something we can't really see. Um, so how do we get a glimpse of what's going on despite that and, and learn about what's happening at night? And then we're going to talk about some of the conservation implications uh, for what we've learned and what we can do going forward to help birds as they, as they journey north and south each year um, yeah, by, by moonlight. So to answer that question, you guys pretty much got all of them. Um, and these are, you know, they're, they're sort of suspected reasons and some of them there's decent evidence to support. Um, but predator avoidance is a big one at night. Uh, you know, they're very exposed when they're migrating. They're out in the open flying, you know, extremely long distances um, and they're, they're exposed. So if you do it at night when there's fewer predators, um, then it'll be that much safer for you. Um, people mentioned favorable, clima favorable climactic conditions. Um, winds tend to be calmer at night. The temperature tends to be cooler, which is really helpful um, if you're a bird who's exerting a lot of energy using your muscles. So yeah, the climactic conditions really are favorable. And we'll, we'll talk about the role that weather plays in this night migration um, partway through the talk. Um, they, it also, nobody said this one, but you know, if you're a bird who needs to find food by day, um, this, this frees you up to do some foraging and to refuel during the day. Um, this is going to vary by species, of course. There are certain species of shorebirds that can fly for upwards of 10 days nonstop um, in, in their annual migrations. Um, but for many of the other birds, uh, daytime is a valuable time to stop and, re and rest and refuel. And then lastly, I think at least you know, one person mentioned this in the chat, that yeah, it's, it's likely that the stars and the moon might aid them in their navigation, figuring out how to get from point A to point B. So there's a lot of really good reasons that birds um, do this this big you know, the migration at night as opposed to during the day. But oh man, imagine if they did this during the day and you could just look up and see the river of birds passing overhead. Um, instead, we need to find other ways to experience migration and to understand it. But you know, how many birds are we really talking about here? How many birds are making this, this big migration? Four billion. <laughs> it's a number that is so massive, it's hard to wrap your head around. But one study said that it's about four billion birds um, in the southbound migration each year. That's when the numbers are a little higher, when you have the, the young of the year moving as well. And to look at a case study, let's take a look at just one species, a species that probably most of us um, have never seen, despite the fact that it moves through Vermont in large numbers. Uh, that bird is the gray-cheeked thrush. Uh, great cheek uh, thrush you know, in Vermont, this might be the one place you're more familiar with Bicknell's thrush, uh, the bird that breeds in high elevation montane habitats. Great cheek thrush looks very similar, but its breeding range is quite a bit farther north, um, all of which is in Canada, and even some of which um, pass over um, the Aleutians and, and get into, into Russia. But um, you know, this entire population of 46 million great cheek thrushes makes this annual migration each year, crossing over the entire continental US. Um, so, you know, what does that number mean in, in the context of the size of our country? If you assume about 2,800 miles across, that means on average, evenly spread out, you're talking about three great cheek thrushes uh, for every foot of land across, going across the U.S. That's an incredible volume. Think about how many feet long your yard is and do the you know, multiplication. Yeah, that means there's dozens of great cheek thrushes going over your house. Of course, you know, this is assuming that these birds are evenly spread out. That's actually not the case. They're not evenly spread out. In fact, they're more heavily concentrated on the East Coast as opposed to the West Coast. So we get an even higher volume than that, most likely. And the reason for that really has to do with geography. And this, uh, this uh, species actually um, depicts that quite well. Um, if you look at on this range map, the yellow in the middle, which uh, is signifying their migratory route, you know, they're not flying over most of the Western US. It's just not really on their way from their wintering to their breeding grounds. But yet they're spreading out across, you know, this, this large circumpolar region um, in, the, in the Western hemisphere. 
And so um, it, it, they're going to be more concentrated in the East. So us on the East Coast get to experience this phenomenon in, in, in a much greater magnitude than those on the West. Oh, by the way, this picture here uh, to the right of the range map, that is a picture of the sound of either a gray cheeked or big nails, most likely gray cheeked thrush um, flying over um, my place in Essex, where I, where I speak to you from today. So the methods of study we're going to discuss are moon watching, then radar, and then flight calls. I'm going to discuss them in increasing uh, <laughs> volume of information as we go across each of these methods. We're going to touch on moon watching just a little, talk a little bit more about radar, um, and then discuss in greater depth uh, the flight calls. Um, I should have said this at the at the onset, but um, I am by no means an expert in the in, in this particular topic of nocturnal migration. I just think it's super cool um, and like sharing that enthusiasm with others. So I'll do my best to to give you know, these these topics their due justice. But we we will certainly not be comprehensive in this talk. Um, but to start with, let's talk about moon watching. That's the thing that yeah, I mentioned in the beginning. A, a couple of us have done, but but not too many. Um, yeah, this is one of the earlier techniques that was used to try to actually measure this phenomenon in a standardized way, is to look up at the disk of the moon and count the number of bird silhouettes that you see flying across it. Um, to a general extent, you can identify species by, by group. Um, you know, some of the waders will be moving slower and their wing beats will be slower. Ducks, their wing beats might be really rapid. Uh, relative size and shape might even be able to, to get picked up um, on birds that are close enough. Um, but, you know, in general, you know, you're limited to only being exposed to what's going across that disk of the moon, which takes up a minuscule percentage of the sky. Um, and then you have to extrapolate out from that how many birds are moving across the entire sky. And the earliest mention I could find, uh, oh, oh, by the way, there's the bird before we move on. This was actually um, one of the big migration days. I think this was the full moon in September of last fall. And that, that is a, a bird flying across the moon. Actually, I'll say now, if you want to try to do this, I recommend a spotting scope if you have one, just because it keeps uh, steady, it's easier to see. I held up a little digital camera and took a video so that when the bird flew across, um, I'd be sure to, to capture it because it happens almost instantly. Um, but even, you know, if you have binoculars, even you could just hold up binoculars and as steady of a hand as you can. And you can see this uh, on the full moons during peak migration. And it's it's really cool to see. Um, but But the earliest ideas were that you could take um, you know, back all the way to 1881, uh, W.E.D. Scott uh, came up with this little simple mathematical representation of how you could measure um, based on the number of birds uh, going across your field of view, um, uh, obscuring the moon, uh, how many birds were in the sky. Um, this was a fairly simple approach and there had been scattered other work in this area um, you know, over the, over the preceding decades, but really in, uh, you know, in the fifties and sixties, uh, a prominent ornithologist at the time, George H. Lowry, um, devoted his PhD dissertation to trying to come up with more rigorous mathematical ways to take the number of birds crossing the moon and translate that into a number of birds actually moving. Um, and this for reasons I'll discuss um, in a moment, helped to pave the way for radar studies of bird migration, which is what we'll talk about next. Um, so to, you know, I told you we're going to be pretty brief on, on birds flying across the moon. Let's talk a little bit longer about radar, though. Um, and really the pioneer of using radar to measure bird migration is a guy, uh, Sidney uh, Gotro, and he actually did his PhD at, uh, in Louisiana under um, the, the previous person uh, who uh, was, you know, really big into the, the moon measuring. And, and part of why how that paved the way is that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Gotra was able to take his observations and, and you know, extrapolations from radar data and compare that to the number of birds that were predicted from moon watching and able to show that those two methods could correlate. So, um, and, and this was in the early days. I think that um, there's this really great um, podcast that I recommend. Um, it's part of the Bird Calls Radio podcast. It's like an hour long interview with Dr. Gotra, who's incredibly well-spoken and goes through in great detail um, the history of how as the quality uh, and technology increased around, around uh, radar, um, that the predictions they were able to make based on, on this data source uh, were able to become more and more refined. Um, radars, after all, their intention is to measure weather, but they can just as easily pick up birds as they move through the atmosphere. And this is a picture of the WRS-57. It's the first radar that Dr. Gotro used in his research. Um, and check out that podcast. It's a really great listen, and you'll learn all about this history in the preceding decades. Uh, Dr. Gotra still publishes in this area today, despite having been retired for a while. But um, we're going to fast forward to now to 1999, and Dr. Gotra was involved with this 
project also called BirdCast. And one of the original motivations or part of it at least was that, you know, if we can use radar to predict weather, then we should be able to use radar to predict bird migration. And this could be of great benefit for all sorts of reasons. Um, one of which uh, helped to bring in funding at the time was that you could inform air traffic controllers of when heavy bird migration was taking place um, to help avoid aircraft bird collisions. Um, and so that early motivation um, you know, is, is part of what sparked BirdCast. Um, but it's evolved a lot since then. As the technology has improved with the latest machine learning uh, methods, um, this is a picture, this is a snapshot from earlier this afternoon of BirdCast as it exists today, much evolved since 1999. And what we see here is that um, it, it, the radar predicts that there's going to be 266 million birds in the air moving north this evening. Um, and it tells us where and in what concentration those birds are predicted to move. So, so this is pretty cool. This is a really awesome product and, and it's, it's gotten better and better as the years go on. And if you're a birder and you're not using BirdCast in the spring and fall, you should. Um, but we're, I wanna take a minute to talk about, you know, that, that's sort of after it goes through all of their filters to, to give us this beautiful uh, forecast. This is what the raw product looks like on the radar end. This is a radar image from, I believe it was Sunday night that I took. And, and we wanna see what, you know, the question is what do birds look like on radar? And so you know, here across most of the east, these little bluish circular tufts here, uh, these are all flocks of birds um, taking off and moving north as the, as the sun went down. This darker band here is a band of thunderstorms. And we see all this migration is really concentrated in just the eastern portion of the country. There's not much moving on the west. Um, and so radar can tell us that, but we can take radar in combination with other information about, uh, about the weather to get a more uh, deeper understanding of what's actually going on here. So we're going to look at a series of maps from this same evening. Um, this is a map looking at the low and the high fronts that are moving through. Um, and generally down here, this red line is a high front. Um, and in general, these are going to be moving, you know, from, you know, towards the, the northwest um, they're going to be bringing warmer air and they're going to be characterized by calmer conditions as opposed to these blue lines, um, which are the, the low fronts and they're you know, generally cooler air moving this is generally sort of southwest. Um, and where these two different fronts meet um, can form a stationary front and is usually characteristic, characterized by rain um, or snow or some sort, of, um, some sort of precipitation. And so we're going to bounce again between this map and another. Um, now we're going to look at a wind map to see what the wind was doing on that evening. Um, and I'm going to click play so we can actually see the direction of the wind. It looks like there's a little sound in the background. Um, and so what you can see is in that eastern portion of the country where birds were moving north, there was gentle north winds that they were able to use to aid their migration. Where birds were not moving, the wind was generally moving south, which would have inhibited their migration. And if we overlay this wind map with that Doppler map, um, we can see here's that band of precipitation uh, right where the cold and the warm fronts or the, the low and the high fronts meet. Um, and that's where the precipitation is. And probably if you were living in one of these places right south of that front, that might be a place where you could experience a fallout where birds are moving north, hit this weather front and cease their northward migration and all sort of just pile up at that point um, to be found the next morning. So um, I'm, not I'm not super good at this, um, using radar to predict bird migration, but um, other people can, are very passionate and good at it. Hopefully I, I did it justice in that very short and simplified explanation. But really, you know, if you don't want to get into the raw data, BirdCast is incredible. This was a map from that same night, Sunday night, showing in real time the birds moving north. Um, and if we compare this, which is what was actually happening, they estimated at this given moment, there was 506 million birds in the atmosphere. Um, the very next, <laughs> so, so that was what actually happened. And this was the prediction. So the predictions are actually getting quite good. Um, and I was recording that night and recorded some pretty cool birds. Okay, so um, that is going to sum up what I'm gonna say about, uh, about radar. And now we're going to get into the part of the talk where I have the greatest expertise and the most interest, which is in auditory monitoring. Um, and we're going to talk now about nocturnal flight calls. So um, I'm going to pause just for a moment. We're going to let everyone catch their breath. And I'm going to give you another question. Um, and I'm going to prompt you to put your answer into the chat. Um, so 
Um, and, and first we will, um, we'll do that after the next slide. I guess I'm prepping you for that. Um, so nocturnal flight calls, these are generally short, simple calls given singly or in a series. Uh, sometimes they're different from the diurnal flight calls of a, spe a given species. Sometimes they're the same. Um, and often they allow for distinctive species level identification. Given the caveat, there's a little asterisk there, given the caveat that you can never actually see the bird. Um, but yeah, you know, so there's all these birds, they're, they're migrating north and south in the, in, the, in the spring and fall. Why are they making noise while they're doing it? And so that's the next thing I want you to put your thinking caps on, try to come up with a plausible explanation for that and then drop it in the chat. And we'll pause for just a minute, let people do that, um, let people catch their breaths a little bit. And, um, and Sean, maybe in like 30 seconds, you can start reading a few off. And I'd, I'd appreciate that. Sure. Thank uh, you very much. I'll read them as, as we go. So uh, we have to avoid crashing into one another, collision avoidance. Please don't bump into me, I'm very small. <laughs> They're trying to imitate Phantom of the Opera. Uh, to, to find each other and keep track of each other, uh, to keep in contact with one another, contact, contact. Um, yeah, lots of variation on the theme of staying together and keeping in touch with one another. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for participating. It's good to have a little interaction. Sometimes partway through, I want to say, is anyone still there? Because um, I can't see everybody. But um, let's let's see how well those answers mesh with uh, what other people think. Again, some of these are theories and um, you know, they, they sort of agree with what everybody had predicted that you know, these, these birds are trying to maintain cohesion of their flocks. Um, they're trying to communicate with each other about, about their whereabouts, perhaps warn each other of potential hazards or danger um, and potentially also encourage others to initiate their migration. Um, some of the studies uh, around this are, are kind of interesting. They took birds, both wild and captive raised and during these peak migration periods, they put them basically on rooftops so that they were exposed to the uh, <laughs> exposed to the to the sky to the clear sky. Um, and these birds in cages became yeah, it's during the migration season they became restless. They started orienting themselves with the directions that they you know would be migrating if they could, and they started calling. And when one bird called, if there was another one that was kind of quiet, that that one was more likely to call too. And there's a number of different studies that have looked at this, and and they're kind of interesting to check out. Um, over, over here in the New World, one of them involved bobolink and another one involved, uh, which was the other species. Um, I'm blanking on it, but it's just hard to picture a bunch of bobolinks on a cage on a rooftop. Um, but, but yeah, so, so the, the, those are the potential reasons why they might be calling, but um, the calling for us, it really offers a, an opportunity uh, to study nocturnal migration in a way that moon watching and, uh, and radar don't. Now, moon watching is great because you know, you're very consistent. It's like the size of the disk of the moon is going to be predictable and, and you know, not change over time. So that gives you something really consistent to measure based off of. But you can't really get that fine-tuned species information. Radar, you get an incredibly comprehensive view of what's happening on a continent-wide scale. And that is invaluable because um, the coverage is complete. Um, but, and, and the technology is getting better. So you can, you know, more so than you could previously, tell the speed of a bird as it's flying. You can tell the size of a bird as it's flying using radar, but it still doesn't give us the species level identifications. Now, nocturnal flight calls, it, it is challenging. It, it is very challenging to know the identification of these uh, calls because, you know, how are you going to confirm something that's happening at night? Um, they have, you have to do rigorous studies of, of you know, seeing birds where you can confirm what the call is and over time build up a level of confidence so that you can, um, you know, be you know, sure that what you're hearing is what you think you're hearing. Um, and, you know, because these calls are very evident, so they're very, you know, if you're outside on a quiet night and your hearing's pretty decent, uh, if you're just quiet, you know, you'll, you'll hear them. So people have known about this since time immemorial. But um, when it comes to actual study of them, you know, you, you see papers in the early 1900s describing you know, how to identify particular species by their flight calls. But this paper, I wanted to, to hone in on a little bit um, because it's one of the first, there's the, at least the first that I came across um, that really talked about recording as being an essential part of you know, this study um, because that allows you to be standardized. You're no longer you know, reliant upon the, you know, the, the quality of the hearing of the person observing as to you know, how repeatable and you know, the, your results might be. Um, and you're able to record for the whole night and go back and listen to those recordings. 
uh, back then, this is a picture I pulled from the paper reference below, um, that you know, this, <laughs> this is the size of the, the recording unit, the parabola microphone that they had at the time. Um, but you know, once you're able to record, then you're really able to do a lot more with this data and make a lot more meaningful inference from it. Um, and then we're going to fast forward. There had been other things since then, but I'm going to fast forward and uh, to a. Uh, oh, we're actually before we fast forward, we'll take a pause. We're going to talk a little bit about sound since we're talking about recording sound and how sound is represented digitally. Um, the pictures we're looking at right now are a waveform of sound, and basically this is measuring um, when a sound occurs, you know, what is the change in, in air pressure um, created by that sound at a given time. And it creates this sinusoidal wave um, that when we look at um, contains all the information needed to reproduce that sound. So you know, if you've ever saved an audio and seen it as a .wav type file, uh, what's being stored in that file is this information, is this, this curve essentially. But this curve is not super amenable to interpretation. Um, and so, Usually when people are looking at, um, at sounds and trying to visualize them in some sort of a meaningful way to interpret, um, we do a mathematical transformation of this, of this wave. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So this exact waveform, if we were to transform it um, using something called a Fourier transform, it's just a mathematical tool um, to convert this waveform um, into a decomposition of the strength of the sound signal uh, by time and frequency. And so I just wanted to have the, these two side by side, but in the next slide, we're gonna zoom in on the, uh, the bottom one, which are commonly called spectrograms. Um, and the, the way to interpret these spectrograms is that each horizontal band um, is representing a specific frequency. So horizontal bands that are lower down are representing lower frequencies, higher up are represent high, representing higher frequencies. And then each vertical band is representing a short window of time. So as we move from left to right, um, we are advancing in time. And the darker the shading, the louder um, that frequency is at that given time. And so this all put together allows us to essentially draw a picture of the sound. Um, and these pictures can be really helpful for interpreting what's going on. And so we'll do one example. I'm going to play this audio uh, for this white-throated bird here. And so it had a, a low pitch high pitch, high pitch, and then a bunch of low pitches. Can you um, play it again, Larry? Yeah, we'll play it again. It's a pure whistle tone. It starts up. We'll play it again here and give another listen. All right, and so that's the sound. Here's the picture of the sound. Um, uh, an even, steady whistle tone, um, low, high, high, and then a bunch of lows at about the same frequency or pitch as the first tone. Um, when you see, when, a, a little bit more about interpreting these, when you see narrow horizontal bands, that tends to represent a pure whistle. If you see like large um, you know, vertical bands, those tend to represent thuds and thumps and things like that. Um, when you see lots of horizontal lines going across, those can be buzzy. Um, so when you get to know these pictures better, as you start to look at them more and more, um, you are able to make better inferences from the picture to what the sound may be. But more than anything, that these pictures are just allowing us uh, you know, to look at this audio in an interpretable form and, and notice differences that might actually be difficult to notice um, you know, by, by ear, by actually listening to them. And we'll, we'll look at more examples of these spectrograms later. Um, this, is, this talk is not an identification <laughs> uh, training talk. We're not going to talk about how to do species ID of nocturnal flight calls here, but I'll, you'll see a bunch more of these just to get some exposure to what they look like from birds heard in the field, so to say. Um, so that brings us to a really pivotal publication, fast forwarding to um, actually 2002 is when the, the publication came out, but a lot of this work actually started in the early 90s done by Bill Evans and Michael O'Brien to try to create essentially a field guide um, to nocturnal flight calls of eastern land birds. And so that includes passerines and near passerines for those who are into those kind of details. Um, it was originally re released as a CD-ROM. I first heard about this during the World Series of Birding when a, uh, an elite team birding uh, teammate uh, had the CD and we were listening to these little, little calls. That's like one is a tip and the other's a chip and the other's a sip. And it was like, it just felt totally impossible. Um, but he was insistent that we could hear birds by night. And I think that year we actually got a great shaped thrush uh, by night. 
Uh, so uh, that was my first exposure, then much time passed. Um, and just a few years ago, the CD-ROM was made freely available online uh, through oldbird.org, um, which is sort of a game changer in, in making that information now publicly available to everybody and, and easily accessible. Um, and this is just the, the best publication of its kind um, and an invaluable resource for people who are into these nocturnal flight calls. Um, so that, that I think helped to spare more interest in nocturnal fly calls and especially in species level identification. Um, then somewhere in the last five or so years, um, you know, there's been a lot more interest in using you know, our, our knowledge of species identification, our ability to record much greater volumes of fly calls at much higher quality and in formats that are much more accessible. Um, that coupled with advances in machine learning have really meant there's a golden opportunity um, to use uh, the state-of-the-art technology um, to analyze uh, nocturnal flight calls in a scale that has never been capable uh, before. And so, you know, BirdVox is just one example of that. It's a collaboration between Cornell Lab of Ornithology and NYU's, uh, you know, Music and Auditory Research Lab. And they've done some interesting work trying to use uh, neural networks to, to classify these, uh, these flight calls. And so, we're going to give just a very brief introduction because it's a particular interest to me in how some of this technology works um, from a from a 10,000 foot view. So from the 10,000 foot view, we are collecting all these flight calls. So we have the raw audio. We're going to convert them into some sort of feature, um, in this case, a spectrogram image. And then we are going to label them by hand. We're going to look at them and make our best determination of what species um, that call represents. And then we're going to pass that labeled data into a classifier or a machine learning algorithm. And that classifier is gonna take that data and figure out how to tell you know, a, a white-throated sparrow from a chipping sparrow. Um, it, you know, if it, all it needs to do is see examples of, of, of identified calls and it can learn how to identify those calls itself. Um, and so after you have trained the thing with a ton of labeled data, now it, you're ready to give it unlabeled data. And that trained classifier will tell you what the identification is. And in case you were wondering, um, this picture up here, actually is a Canada warbler. So <laughs> my, my made up classifier got it right, of course. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not totally there yet. Um, identification of nocturnal fly calls is not a solved computational problem, but, you know, I, I foresee that a lot of really good progress in this area in the next couple of years. And, um, you know, the, the dream is always that you could have, you know, some sort of microphone that you could stick outside your house. It's gonna turn itself on at the right time, turn itself off at the right time download all of the audio and tell you what flew over. You'll wake up in the morning and, it, and you'll know what flew over your house the night before. Um, I, I look forward to a day where that happens. It, we're not totally there yet. And I'll give you a, a little glimpse into my workflow for how I work with nocturnal flight call data um, right now. <laughs> so this is the Essex Junction nocturnal flight call station. Um, and zooming in, there's my bucket mic. <laughs> um, and so this is what it looks like. I live in a very suburban area of Essex Junction. There's not like stellar habitat right next to me or anything like that, but that doesn't matter because it's migration. You just need birds to be flying over you. It doesn't matter what your habitat's like where you are. Um, the microphone I use is an old bird 21C. It's uh, made by Bill Evans. Um, and it's a microphone that's optimized to record these often very faint, very high frequency calls at night when there's not a lot of other noise. Um, and so it's a, it's a highly specialized microphone, but it does a good job for what its purpose is. And I have that bungee to my fence and a cord wraps around, goes through my window um, to my computer where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> and uh, right now I have a program open called Audacity. It's a free software that you can use to record and listen live while you're recording. So like last night while I was putting some finishing touches on the slides here, I had my headphones on and I was actually listening to nocturnal flight calls while making the slide about nocturnal flight calls. Um, and just wait till you hear what I, what I heard. <laughs> You're not gonna believe it, it's wild. Um, but before we get to that, a little tease there. Um, Audacity is a great free software, it's extremely popular. Um, lots of people have made lots of modifications to make it even more powerful. Um, but all it does is record and allow you to listen and allow you to clip and run some basic filters. Um, if you wanna actually have the computer do the work for you of, of finding these calls and, and potentially identifying them, um, there are some detectors, uh, Seep and Thrush are detectors uh, produced in the late 90s um, as part of Old Bird um, and, and Bill Evans's work. And um, they're still great. They allow for, they're very fast. They're simpler computationally than some of the more advanced methods. But that means you can get um, detections back 
almost in real time as you're recording, um, yeah, alerting you to what, <laughs> what's actually going over and what's just noise. Uh, Vesper is a newer software, it's sort of still in development, um, but uh, it, it is a really promising new tool that allows a lot more <laughs> manipulation of your flight calls and, and storage of them and whatnot, and has its own more sophisticated detectors built in, as well as Seep and Thrush built in. Um, Raven is put out by Cornell Lab and AM Monitor, I'll mention, just because that's a project that I'm going to be working on in the, in the near future. Um, it does automatic detection, but it's, it's cooked into um, an R package that also does um, adaptive management uh, you know, simulations and whatnot. It, 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 help, it helps provide information from the detected calls uh, that can inform adaptive management. So a um, little shout out to that. Um, and now a couple other resources just to mention really briefly. Old Bird, I said already, eBird can be valuable. There's a Facebook group for nocturnal flight call identification that's really stellar. Um, Richard um, Litauer and I put together a Vermont listserv for nocturnal flight call um, interested people. And you can just reach out to me through Sean or, or directly if you're interested in that. And then I'll give a shout out to Richard's website, birdinginvermont.com, where he has put together a whole bunch of species identification pages for nocturnal flight calls. Uh, Richard, thanks for taking all my 1 a.m. Uh, texts and emails about, about the cool stuff that's flying over. <laughs> um, as of last year, it was pretty much just Richard and I doing nocturnal flight call monitoring in Vermont. Um, I think there's growing interest though, and I wanted to sort of round out the last part of uh, monitoring techniques with a little bit of the early results uh, and what I've seen going over. So here are some of the highlights from last year um, and of, of what birds flew over Essex Junction. And we'll start off with some water birds. And just to mention a few of particular interest, Brant um, is one that, you know, it's a it's a, the sea goose. They're normally really seen primarily on the coast and in small numbers in spring and more so fall migration in Vermont. But a lot of them fly over at night. So the, the migration is happening. They're flying right, right over your head. You're just not awake to, to see it. Um, but if, you, if your microphone's turned on, you might be lucky enough to record it. And if you happen to be awake, you might be lucky enough to hear it in real time. And so I had, uh, I think, three flocks of Brant go over that, that May evening um, of last year. Virginia rail is just sort of a crazy one. It's amazing how many of these birds are vocalizing while going over. Um, I had at least 10 Virginia rails while I was making this presentation, listening live last night, which is crazy. These are like secretive marsh birds. Like what are they doing just calling as they fly over your, your house in the middle of the night? But um, their vocalizations, um, except for one really bizarre one, are tend to be similar to their daytime vocalizations. This, this is the kiddick call for those who, who know that Virginia rail call. Um, Lee's bittern, on the other hand, it gives a completely different nocturnal flight call from any call that it gives during the daytime. And they tend to be pretty vocal at night when they migrate. So Lee's bittern, another super secretive marsh bird, really hard to see um, and you know, fairly scarce in our area, is one that shows up pretty regularly when you're doing nocturnal flight call monitoring. It's like almost like the world is reversed, like the, yeah, uh, the, the rare becomes sort of common almost. It's, it's bizarre and, and wonderful. Um, I, there's a little link here at the top. I contemplated putting you know, some play buttons and playing this here, but I think the reduction in audio quality just discouraged me from it. This link will take you to a website that has the audios associated with all of these spectrograms and more, um, all things I recorded last year. So you know, as, as I'm talking about some of these things, if you wanna hop onto that website um, in the background and, and listen to some of these and see what they sound like, um, you know, feel free to do so. All right, so that's some water birds. Um, I was just floored by the number of shorebirds that fly over. Um, and shorebirds tend to be very vocal during migration. Um, they tend to give calls that are similar to their daytime calls, but sometimes even that can present some tricky ID challenges because shorebirds have extremely plastic calls and they can be extremely variable. Um, but you know, within what I've heard already, um, this, the clear highlight is upland sandpiper. Um, upland sandpiper is an extremely rare breeder in Vermont um, and a fairly scarce migrant. Um, last fall, I recorded over the course of two nights, two different upland sandpipers going over, which at the time in eBird, I think there was only two eBird records for upland sandpiper fall migration records, like period. So I think I, we doubled them from, from <laughs> just what I heard in my place. And Richard picked up an upland sandpiper in Montpelier as well. So Richard and I beat the record for upland sandpipers in like the last, we had more in the last 20 years between our two places in Montpelier, downtown Montpelier and, and downtown Essex Junction as had occurred in the whole state of Vermont over the past 20 years. So 
Um, and I had an upland sandpiper actually two days ago go over the spring. So, um, you know, nocturnal flight calls because the upland sandpiper is one of those that you know, is po potentially flying straight over Vermont without ever setting down. This is a way that we can actually get a glimpse into how many are going over, an, an unbiased glimpse into how many might be going over. Um, Ruddy Turnstone has a question mark because it was a tough call. We, we narrowed it down to Ruddy Turnstone or Willet, both of which are pretty good birds for, for springtime in Vermont. Okay, so shorebirds, just wow. There's a lot of them and so cool. Um, now let's look at some songbirds. Um, the cuckoos are pretty incredible. They're birds that, again, have a reputation for being extremely secretive, but are extremely vocal at night. Um, it's even thought that these species might be partially nocturnal because even on the breeding grounds, they're frequently heard after dark. Um, but you know, you will hear dozens of black-billed cuckoos um, during spring migration. Um, and it's one of the lower frequency calls, which means the detectors don't pick them up as well. The automated detectors don't pick them up as well, but they're actually easy to hear with the naked ear. And this is the one that back in 2018, um, I heard while looking at some moths outside and, and it sort of re-sparked after a bunch of years of, of, you know, of disengagement. It re-sparked my interest in nocturnal flight calls and, and nocturnal flight call monitoring. Um, and then one more to mention, great cheek bicknells. We mentioned that at the beginning. This is a good example of, you know, there are still some limits in terms of what we can say about species level identification from nocturnal flight calls. Um, there's some pretty good clues about how to differentiate these two species, but there's still more work to be done to confirm it, especially here in Vermont, where both would be expected to be passing over. But nonetheless, you know, it's a, whether it's a great cheek or a bicknells, it's an uncommon bird in migration in Vermont. And yet in the spring and fall, you pick up, you know, like a dozen or more of them um, just going over any, any random place, uh, for example, Essex Junction. Um, a couple more songbirds. Let's see, the one to mention here is grasshopper sparrow, another one that's pretty, um, pretty scarce up this, in this part of its range. Um, and yet, uh, you know, I've, I heard them last spring and I heard them again this spring and I'm still learning the identifications. It's possible there was others that I, I didn't pick up because um, uh, I'm doing a lot of manual inspection of these spectrograms rather than the machine learning. So who knows, maybe there's more grasshopper sparrows that went over that I haven't ID'd yet, but um, uh, just an incredible variety, as you can see, of, of bird species um, with a couple slashes in here because there, there are limits to, to our knowledge on these calls. Um, here's a couple of, of some warbler flight calls. The top one is a black and white warbler. The bottom is a Cape May warbler. These are some of the shorter and higher pitch calls. And so um, our frequency tends to, you know, our, our high frequency hearing tends to go as we age. Um, just recently, we were playing around with a, a 17 kilohertz tone. You can go on YouTube, pull up a 17 kilohertz tone, play it and see based on the age of the person listening who can hear it. <laughs> My five-year-old heard it perfectly well from across the room and and for me, it was like the hearing had to be right next to my ear. So it's, it's pretty interesting how high, high frequency hearing goes as we age. But um, that's one of the benefits of doing spectrograms is that we can, we can see pictures of those sounds. And even though we might not be able to hear them, we can still see them and identify the birds from them. And that's pretty cool. So, um, so now let's talk about nocturnal migration and conservation. So the bad news here is that as much as I sort of talk about rivers of birds flowing over our heads, those numbers are greatly reduced from what they were, you know, 50 years ago. Um, we've lost, you know, roughly a third of our birds over those intervening decades. And it's incredible to think of, of what it must have been like to step outside and hear it then. And there's this risk of the acclimation of the new normal. You know, for me, I go outside, I hear all these birds, it sounds incredible. I have no perception of what was lost because I never experienced it. Um, and you know, this is one area where actually nocturnal migration has allowed us uh, to have that long-term memory, um, to realize that we have actually lost this incredible biomass. Uh, radar studies were a really important part of the work in the past couple of years that, that came up with this 3 billion number. Um, and you know, part of what supported the fact that we've lost this many birds was that you were able to arrive at the same conclusion for a number of different methodologies. And so radar studies were an important methodology to, to really build up a body of scientific evidence that you know, has really shined a spotlight on the fact that we need to do more to protect birds. And so with the last couple slides, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the risks uh, caused by man that birds face during their nocturnal migrations and a, just a little bit about what's being done to try to make some improvements in those areas. So first we're gonna do a case study. 
the case of the crash landing grids. Um, when I read this article, it just floored me. <laughs> this is back in 2018 um, over Utah. Um, over 3,000 eared grebes crash landed into a Walmart parking lot. Um, you read descriptions in the articles at the time that came out about people are just like grabbing as many grebes as they can and just shoving them in their cars. They, they estimated that there's no telling how many grebes died from that event, um, but at least over a thousand. Um, and this was a situation where these birds were migrating all together um, and uh, you know, they, they came across some inclement weather and they needed to, they needed to stop migrating. It came time to land and, you know, a wet parking lot that's illuminated by um, artificial light uh, can look an awful lot like a, like a big pond, like a big shiny uh, surf, you know, water surface. So it, it's no surprise that, that birds can crash land like this. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's because that these, you know, wet roadways can, and wet concrete can easily be mistaken for, for water. Now here's another case study, the, the April 2012 rednecked grebe that crash landed on the sidewalk in Montpelier, Vermont. Um, we, this is at North Branch Nature Center. Got a, Chip got a call. Someone had a, a, a strange bird on the sidewalk downtown. And so you know, Chip Darmstadt to the rescue went and grabbed this grebe and we got it to a rehabber in Waterbury who informed us that this bird was eventually re-released into the wild. But you know, it's just hard to imagine walking down the sidewalk in Montpelier and coming upon this bird because you know, unless you knew about nocturnal migration, you'd have no idea that these birds are regularly flying over in the spring and fall. Um, now let's just pause for a moment and really look at this grebe, like really take it all in. Like, this is just fantastic. I don't know. Good work, Chip, you're a hero. Um, <laughs> so, so, that's, so that's one thing, we have birds crash landing. Now we're gonna talk about a much larger source of mortality, which is window collisions. Um, it's estimated, um, a study, I think 2012 came out that estimated up to 1 billion birds die due to window collisions each year. Um, and so this is a, a known source of mortality. It does not include only during migration, but certainly during migration is a time that birds are particularly susceptible. And um, there's lots of great work um, going around to try to mitigate for this. Um, there are ways in terms of building, you know, building design uh, to reduce the chance of window strikes. Um, it's a little bit hard to convince builders to change their designs. So having a greater body of evidence to you know, show the value of that is really important. Um, UVM is a great example where there was just a lot of renovations that went on. Um, and you know, mortality of birds on campus remains a problem. And, and uh, Jacob Crawford and I think some of his classmates at UVM, he's I think on the Green Mountain Audubon Society board as well, started this iNaturalist uh, project to try to keep track of some of the window strike stricken birds at UVM, which would hopefully you know, be used as evidence to support mitigation efforts down the road. Um, you'd imagine in big cities, this is more of a problem than in rural areas, um, that if you thought that, indeed, you would be correct. Um, the Audubon chapters in New York City have done a lot of advocacy work and, and you know, really boots on the ground, uh, grassroots monitoring work to monitor window strikes within New York City and, um, and really influence policy there that could help some of these birds out. Um, because you know, one, in one factor that really does contribute to greater uh, mortality due to collisions um, during migration is artificial light. Um, this is a picture of the 9-11 Memorial in New York City. Um, every, every year, September 11th, they shine these two beams of light into the air um, where, the, where the Twin Towers once stood. Um, it's really a touching and beautiful tribute, uh, which unfortunately happens to fall right within the peak window of fall bird migration. Um, and it's estimated that every year when these lights are on, over a thousand birds at least get captured um, circling around these beams of light. Um, we know that birds somehow are, are likely using you know, the stars or the moon to help them navigate and artificial lights tend to th to throw them off. Um, around artificial lights, you hear increased frequency of flight calls. You see birds circling and generally behaving disoriented. And um, so through the, the work of New York City Audubon, they actually have people monitoring. There's people sitting under these beams of light each year looking up at them. And um, as after the, co the concentrations build up to a certain level and the bird's altitude begins to drop, they actually turn those lights off for a couple minutes at a time to allow those birds to resume their migration. Um, and there's just a lot of generally uh, important advocacy work going on uh, through Audubon and their Lights Out campaign to try to get big cities to, you know, during these, these peak windows of migration, because like what you'll find is that if you do nocturnal flight call monitoring, there's like, it's not like the big night like amphibians where everything moves at once, but there are specific nights where conditions are favorable, where you get huge scale movements. So it's not like you need to have a whole city go dark 
you know, from, from, uh, from August through November in order to keep the birds safe. Like if you can find those, you know, four or five nights in the spring and fall where the most birds are going through and get a city to, to turn its lights off for a little bit to let those birds keep moving, you can make an incredible impact. Um, but really, you know, this migration is such a mystery and there's still so much to be learned, even right here in Vermont as some of you know, my own sort of hobbyist uh, monitoring has revealed that, um, you know, the more interest there is in this, like any aspect of, of the natural world, um, the more people care about it, the, the more will happen to try to, to, to do something about it. So I think we've got just a few minutes left. I want to wrap up by, uh, again, thanking the hosts here. Uh, North Branch Nature Center. I love you guys. You know, Sean, thank you for helping coordinate this. Uh, Chip, Ken, Amy, Emily, Emily, Zach, all of you guys are just amazing. Um, Green Mountain Audubon Society, particularly Josh Lincoln for inviting me a long time ago to, to come give a talk and, and to everybody else from Green Mountain Audubon Society for, for coordinating this and making it possible. Uh, Richard, thanks for putting up with my texts and, and continue to chat with me about nocturnal flight call monitoring and, and provide a, a valuable resource to others uh, who wish to do so. Uh, Bill Evans, just a shout out because you know, that that guide is really what allowed me and so many other people to get into it. And uh, there's a really vibrant uh, community on Facebook of people who are so willing to share knowledge and help identify tricky calls and and just chat about these things. So um, it's a it's a great time to get into nocturnal flight call monitoring or any other form of of migration monitoring that might interest you. And with the couple minutes we have left, Sean, I think we can do questions. So uh, thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, I'll echo Tracy's comment that just came in that says, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for this informative talk. Um, uh, Tracy. I'm, I'm inspired to get out and spend some time under the moon. Um, lots of questions, Larry. Um, a couple of quick uh, logistical questions first. Wondering, uh, Ned's wondering if that BirdCast resource, the radar uh, site, mm -hmm. if they actually log and archive previous night's radar so they can go in and see what happened the previous day. They do to a certain extent. Um, don't quote me on how much is archived or how far back, but the answer to that is yes. And, and the website is, you can Google BirdCast, of course, but the direct link is birdcast.info. Um, I'll, I'll mention now, Sean, before you do the next one, that um, I, I chose not to include citations within the slides because they tend to distract and not be consumed very much by people watching in real time, but including you know, picture references, um, references for more information, like the links where I got those radars, those are all available and please reach out to me if, if you'd like those. I'm happy to provide those and extremely grateful to the entities that, that create all that incredible and valuable content. Um, on that note, Larry, um, when I put up the presentation um, at our website, northbranchnaturecenter.org slash presentations, um, underneath the, the video, I'm gonna put all the, the uh, relevant links that you were talking about tonight. From, Wonderful, I have um, some that didn't appear in the slides, so I'll make sure you get them. Thank you, Sean, okay, that's, great. that's amazing. Great, um, and then I've been putting in the chat as we've gone, folks, if you wanna open up the chat, you should be able to see some of the links that I've, that as Larry has been mentioning things, I've been dropping those links into the chat, but but if you go check out the presentation, you'll be able to, to get access to all of that, um, all those hyperlinks. Um, Let's see. Um, wondering if um, birds are more likely to be migrating on clear starry nights or if they also migrate on cloudy nights as well. Um, it's a really good question. Um, and so, yeah, there's some evidence that would suggest that, you know, if they're using the stars to navigate, that they would favor those sorts of clear nights. Um, and I think that there's some evidence to suggest that, but I'm not sure how solid that evidence is. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to punt on this one and say I'm not totally sure. Um, one thing I will tell you in terms of the frequency um, and quality of flight calls that you hear, um, sometimes on cloudy nights, if winds are still favorable for movement, you can actually get extremely high quality recordings because these birds, they might be flying a thousand feet up. Um, if you tend to have a low ceiling, um, they're not gonna be flying in the clouds. They're going to be flying lower down and you might actually get higher quality or higher fidelity recordings of them. Um, and so some of my best nights of recording have actually been when there's a little bit of cloud cover. But in terms of the exact volume and how weather affects it, I know there's been some work and I just don't recall because there's just a lot of studies. So um, I will collaborate with Sean on getting a little link in the uh, episode notes, whatever we call them, uh, underneath the presentation. I'll try to put a little link to an answer to that question because it's a good one. 
Yeah, sure. And I guess on that note too, another question was about whether or not birds will be migrating if it's raining and if there's a lot of precipitation or if they're pretty much hunkered down on those nights. Yeah, they're probably not going to migrate much if it's precipitating. There's been some people who have said that, you know, as there's a light rain that can again be you know, favorable for hearing certain things because it's going to be putting them down a little bit. Um, and so, uh, but, but yeah, if there's heavy precipitation, it's, that's not going to be good conditions to migrate. Uh, these birds expend an incredible amount of energy. And so the winds play a very large role in it. If they are having to fight a headwind, you're going to have a lot less of them moving. Um, logically, it holds that you, it would be the same thing if it's raining, that that's going to inhibit their movement. Um, uh, another question that, that came in about what you were mentioning before, that's relevant to what you are just mentioning before around altitude. I'm wondering um, how, I think this was, uh, Bona was asking, um, at what altitude are these birds migrating is kind of the first question. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question is how high in the air can you actually catch recordings of different qualities? Ooh, it's a really good question. I, again, that's one I don't know the answer to. I'm not afraid to <laughs> admit where I, where I don't know things, and this is more a hobby for me than an area of, of expertise, but um, they can be quite high up. I know that there have been some studies that tried to estimate how high up they can be. Um, now, that's something that with radar, you can tell with the current radar technology. You can tell how, at what altitude, um, you know, something in, in the happens to be in the atmosphere. But I remember reading one of the earlier studies where they were looking, you know, they're using moon watching to actually try to predict this. And based on how high the moon was above the horizon and, you know, whether you could see the bird flying across it or not, they, they somehow use that to, to make some predictions. These birds can be a thousand foot up plus. Um, how you tell at what altitude you can still hear recordings, that's a tricky one. There might have been some work on that, but not that I'm immediately aware of. You guys ask really good questions. Well, it just goes to show how how relatively young this uh, this pursuit is as well, right? These are these are um, very important questions that uh, that still have big open that don't have answers yet. Yeah, well, at least not answers that I know. It's also a symptom of how how new to this I am uh, personally. But it, it is, I mean, especially in the identification realm. There's some of the flight calls that we try to identify. It's based off of a relatively small sample size and. Um, there's there, like there's literally a lot of information that is still to be learned that will continue to advance this field of study as time goes on. So it's um, an exciting time to, to get into it because even though it's been, you know, a hundred years that people have been interested in this question, it, it is a tricky one to study. And, um, and so that's a good point. A couple other kind of quick natural history questions. Um, it, how, how fast are these birds moving? Could you give us kind of an estimation for a few different groups of how, how fast they're actually moving through the sky? Um, yeah, another one that I'm not totally sure about. The smaller ones tend to move slower. I think that some of the, the songbirds can be moving like maybe 15 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, something like that. Um, don't quote me on the exact number, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. Um, now that is going to be you know, faster than um, you know, than the actual wind speed. So you know, this, this does tend to be powered flight. Um, there, you know, there, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of flapping that goes on in this, as opposed to you know, raptor migrations that people might think about in the in the fall, where you know, birds are floating from thermal to thermal. Um, there, ten, there does tend to be a lot of flapping, and you know, sometimes when we're recording, a bird doesn't vocalize. We only hear its wing beats. We just hear the flaps, um, and sometimes the speed of those flaps might give you an indication of the both the kind of bird and potentially the speed of travel. But um, that raises but, another question, Larry. But I, I will say, I will say, even though I don't know off the top of my answer the question to the answer to these great questions, um, you know, the radar technologies right now can answer those with with fine grain detail. Um, on a, kind of a related one is is uh, how many how many recordings are you getting on a good night in Essex Junction? Um, oh yeah, you're right. So I didn't even mention this. So, I mean, on a good night, like on my best nights, which tend to be an order of magnitude more than, you know, the, uh, an average night or a quiet night. Yeah. It could be a couple thousand calls. I think that my top night last fall was, I didn't count them up individually because it's just rather labor intensive to do by hand, but yeah, we're in the, in the, in the thousand plus numbers of calls, um, of those, not all of them can be identified to species, but just as a little, little teaser, I was listening like I mentioned last night, um, while I was working on some of the presentation, and I had at least ten Virginia rails. I had, you know, maybe a half dozen hermit thrushes, tons of white-throated sparrows and chipping sparrows and other sparrows. And then 
I had a whippoorwill go over last night, <laughs> which is just totally floors me. It's a bird that is you know, fairly uncommon in Chittenden County. And in all the time I've been birding here, I can think of like one that was sort of reliable for a couple of weeks. Uh, otherwise they just sort of here and then gone. So, you know, to hear a whippoorwill is, is kind of neat. And, and, and like, if you start nocturnal flight call monitoring, you're almost guaranteed to bump into something that would be very unusual to, to find by day. Um, and that's part of the fun of it. So um, yeah, on a, on a quiet night, it could be just a handful. And then of course, um, as the migration season peters out, eventually the skies get quiet again, except for, except for the local birds that are just out for a little flap. Um, if folks are looking to um, get their own kind of starter equipment, um, I know you had that, you, you were talking a little bit about the software and the equipment um, that you use. Are there, are there other recording devices other than um, what Bill Evans has put together? That oh, to totally. If you're someone who just sort of wants to see, you know, what it's like, you could use a smartphone, take a smartphone and yeah, you know, they call them like the flower pot microphone. You can take a flower pot and it just sort of helps to capture the sound and almost act like a parabola, you know, stick your smartphone, you know, in, in, a, in one of those little buckets, you know, set it out, record for 15 minutes or something like that. And then you can take it in, download it to your computer, uh, download Audacity, which is a free program. Um, open it up and start looking at spectrograms and see what you get. You can get decent recordings just from a smartphone. Um, they're not, you know, it's not going to be obviously as high quality as a microphone that's specialized for it. But you know, if if your interest is more just like, wow, you know, the Birdcast said that there's 500 million birds in the air tonight, and Vermont looks like it's going to be, you know, lit up like a Christmas tree. Let's stick my phone out in the flower pot for 15 minutes and see what we get, and you might be surprised at, at what you do. Um, now, if you want to go all in like I have, and you're recording every night, that's when you really start to bump into the, you know, the, the more unusual stuff is when you have these long continuous nightly recordings because, you know, it, it's amazing what you'll hear if, you, if you're there to, to listen to it. So if you're not listening, you're not going to hear it. Um, and, and if you're willing to listen, man, it's amazing what, what you know, this guy has to tell you. Uh, Larry, we have so many questions. Um, so I'll defer to you in terms of how long you have before you have to return to your, your parenting duties here. Yeah, um, let's, let's keep going. Hopefully I'll be able to answer one of them eventually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. And I just want to apologize to folks that um, uh, I'm sure we're not going to get to all of them. So I apologize in advance if we, if we don't uh, get them all. And maybe we'll do a little lightning round a little bit later. Um, uh, so you mentioned that um, some of these nocturnal flight calls are similar enough to the calls that they make diurnally. It is pretty obvious what it is. Um, mm -hmm. But for the ones where it's not clear, how do you actually tie the sound you're hearing in the sky to an actual real bird in real life to be able to, to confirm um, the connection between those? Yeah, it, it's hard. And you need to have a certain level of comfort with uncertainty um, that, <laughs> that that might actually push you out of your comfort zone. It's a, and, and that's true more so with some species than others. So you know, the way that, you know, that um, the, the Evans and O'Brien publication went about this was that you know, a call that's confirmed, it needs to be of a, of a bird that was seen. And so this can happen if it's a, a diurnal flight call of a bird, um, maybe that's getting close to sunset and it happens to give um, that, that nighttime vocalization. Um, you can do studies where birds are, you know, you take a wild bird, it's held captive and it's put up into the, the, the cage at night on the roof, um, you know, try to, to get it to, you know, do that song where it's captured and you can actually hear it. Um, you can also try to catch these birds um, early in the morning. Uh, sometimes they'll overshoot where they want it to be. Um, particularly, this can happen near the coast. And some of the work that went into that publication, I believe, was, was in Cape May, where this phenomenon can be seen. And as the birds are coming back in after their night migrations, like early in the morning after sunrise, you can pick out a few calls that way. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a challenging and uh, labor-intensive process. You know, how are you going to how are you going to see a bird make a sound at night that it only makes at night? It's, yeah, it's tough. Uh, other people have done studies where you sh actually shine a beam of light up into the sky and you look at birds that fly across that beam. Uh, that seems like a tough one too, but um, yeah, that's why I think that, you know, the, I should throw that in as a caveat. The calls that I um, showed, I have a reasonable level of confidence of my identifications of them, but um, you know, as, what level of certainty do you need to, to know for sure that that's what it was? Uh, I'm not sure I can get you that level depending on what it is, but um, other species, you know, like shorebirds, like I mentioned previously, they tend to have the same daytime vocalizations as nighttime. 
you know, least bittern is kind of a special case where it does it. You know, it has one that's done pretty much exclusively at night, but then many others, maybe they have a typical daytime flight call, but occasionally you'll hear the nighttime flight call during the day. Um, but you know, it's, it's a great opportunity for someone to do a PhD if they wanted to. There's a lot more out there to be learned still. Um, I'm going to read off Erica's question here. How does the computer recognition work by visual analysis of spectrograms? How similar is this to your recognition? Do you work primarily from audio or from reading the spectrograms visually or both? You know, it's interesting because um, there are some species that are much easier to identify by looking at the spectrogram. Um, maybe because the calls are very short in duration, um, like you know, if they're under a tenth of a, you know, a tenth of a second, that's that's pretty tough to to hear if it's really high frequency. Some of the finer detail, uh, but then there's others like um, between spotted sandpiper and solitary sandpiper. They can look very similar on the spectrogram, especially if they're intermediate frequency, um, but can still have a slightly different character when you actually listen to it. And especially some of the herons, some of the, which are tough to begin with. You know, some of the much lower frequency things, it can be harder to read on the spectrograms, especially if the signal of noise to if the noise to signal ratio is high. Um, the spectrograms might be more difficult to interpret compared to actually hearing it. Um, in terms of the most popular machine learning algorithms today, um, they're convolutional ne neural networks and a, a subcategory of those called deep neural nets. Um, they're, they, they thrive on massive amounts of data and do incredibly well with image recognition. And a lot of work that's being done is around just that, is, is in taking the picture, that spectrogram, you know, you did that conversion from waveform to spectrogram, um, and then it's essentially image recognition. And so that is how um, I think many of the state, or most of the state-of-the-art algorithms are, are doing their identifications is, um, is, is um, through, <laughs> through those means. Uh, but there's a diff distinction also between classification and detection. And detection, the algorithms are actually extremely good at picking up, especially in the higher frequency zones, most of the calls that are happening, even, even fairly weak calls. But the technology continues to improve. At some point in the future, that technology might switch over from using the spectrogram to using the raw waveform data. I, I don't know if that will happen. There's um, you know, certain algorithms in other areas of machine learning involving audio. Um, that do use raw waveform to learn. Um, but for now, uh, that's how it's done is the computer is looking at something similar to what I see. And then of course, you know, in terms of my own workflow, um, yeah, if, if there was a night where there wasn't much happening, <laughs> um, I will just very quickly breeze through the spectrogram. Um, and if I see a call, I stop and I listen to it. Um, sometimes I can tell what it is just from looking, um, but usually I like to have a good listen because it's a, uh, yeah, the translation, even after looking at these these things for a long time, from spectrogram to what it actually sounds like, yeah, you're not going to get all the way there just from looking at it. So it's good to always listen to these things too. All right, we're going to, I have one more question, then we'll do a lightning round. Um, so uh, a bunch of folks are asking um, how we can hear some of the recordings that you've done at your house. I know that you intentionally kept audio out of this presentation because of just the audio quality. Would you remind us how to find uh, your recordings and stuff? Yeah, so let me just go back a couple slides. Um, here we go. So here's a, this is just sort of like a temporary URL just to get you there quicker. That doesn't involve any necessary tildes. Um, so tinyurl.com slash NFC Vermont, all capitals for NFC Vermont. Um, that is an incredibly out of date uh, website with just some highlights on it. Um, some of this stuff has went into eBird, but it's at various stages of review. So um, you shouldn't really go looking for these things on eBird, at least from Vermont um, at the current time. Um, we're working on that, but um, this is where you can find uh, some nice, uh, essentially all these spectrograms that I showed you, plus many, many more, and also listen to them. If you have headphones, listen with headphones, it'll be a little higher quality, um, which makes a difference for some of these, but um, you know, your phone speakers will work just as well if you don't have have the headphones. Great, thanks. And, and again, I'll put all the links um, yeah. in the uh, in the presentation. Uh, lightning, lightning round. I go to my Pippet lightning bolt calls for the right. lightning round. Very nice. All right, Chip's asking, or Chip's saying, don't forget to tell us about the amazing bird you heard last night. The whippoorwill. The whippoorwill. That's yeah, cool. I mean, that's wild. Like, who else has whippoorwill and least bittern on their yard list here? Right, show of hands. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, let's see, Jack is asking, 
Dr. Klarfeld, what are you working on with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife right now? Is it related to bioacoustics? Um, so the answer is yes. Um, I will say this talk is just for fun. It's not affiliated with my position um, with a cooperative unit, but uh, my work is going to be uh, focused around using these types of um, autonomous monitoring techniques um, to learn about wildlife populations. Um, there's some great tools that have been made by uh, some of my predecessors, um, uh, that you know, one of which is called AM Monitor. It's for adaptive management monitoring, and um, it will work with some algorithms that take calls and learn how to identify them, and then you know, do a little bit of population modeling to tell you that. And you know, right now, I'm working on some user interface and stuff so that you know all this, all this whole package I'm working on is in R, uh, the programming language R. Um, and so we're working on getting to a point where we have a user interface where people can um, interact with this tool, even if they don't know R. Um, we're also looking at incorporating, because right now it's so far just been audio, we're looking at incorporating pictures into it. And so let's say you are doing autonomous monitoring using a camera trap, like a game cam, um, and you have 50 game cams uh, deployed across a large area for a long period of time. Um, you know, you, you could use this tool to identify what animals happen to be in those images. So hopefully we'll get there, you know, coming the, this coming summer. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm back in this field. Uh, my PhD was not in conservation related topics. I worked with some incredibly smart, you know, brilliant, devoted people on some um, hard problems related to power systems risk analysis and understanding uh, communications between uh, seriously ill patients and, and their, their physicians. So I did some really interesting work in other places um, with some really great people, super psyched to be doing conservation work again. Um, and I don't know, maybe the next talk will, will be about that stuff, but. It is fascinating how similar skill sets can be applied so broadly across different disciplines um, in such effective ways. That's that's really fascinating that you bring up all those different connections between your your work and your research and your hobbies. Um, that's my fault for asking a question like that in a lightning round. Yeah, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> um, what about hummingbirds? Asks Janet. Um, so hummingbirds, uh, like, I don't know if you've heard a hummingbird vocalization, they are pretty tough to hear even when they're not flying high. Um, I don't think there's, there's any known recordings of hummingbirds doing nocturnal migration. They are incredible migrants, you know, they can fly 500 miles nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico, which is really remarkable for a bird that, <laughs> that weighs like, a, like, a, like a, less than a nickel. Um, but I don't know that any have ever been picked up on, you know, using any of these, these methods of study. Um, yeah, so good question. Are most birds flying over Vermont? Are they going farther north? Or are they staying in the Vermont area? Another, another really great question. Um, I mean, just based on what we know about populations of birds, um, there's a lot of birds that breed to our north and winter to our south. All of those birds are going to have to fly across our latitude at some point, you know. Some of them will fly over Vermont, some of them won't. But yeah, th this is where migration can get kind of confusing. You can have a bird like the, uh, you know, the blue jay that you know, is here year round, um, but is also migratory. It happens to be a diurnal migrant. You can actually see you know, large flocks of blue jays migrating during the day, which is pretty cool to see. And they don't make a whole lot of noise when they do it, which is funny for a bird that's normally so boisterous. But um, you know, the, the blue jay, some of them will leave Vermont in the winter for points farther north, and some might come from points farther south and end up in Vermont. How you tease that apart? That's another great question that I don't know the answer to. I'm sure there's been some work in that and there's some knowledge about it, but I'm not aware of it. Um, let's see, um, is there a connection between, do you suspect between wind generators and migration, particularly nocturnal migration? Um, yeah, so it's been studied. It, it does have impacts. They're not large, my understanding is, compared to some of the other uh, major problems <laughs> facing birds. Um, that, and, and there is sometimes mitigation. I think it's going to be highly variable based on where you are. But again, one of the nice things about this and one of the things we can learn from a conservation perspective is that, you know, the, the evenings where there's going to be a lot of migration um, can be predicted and, you know, wind generation can be curtailed during those nights. Um, and there certainly are programs, I think, more focused around bats, honestly, than birds. Um, but there are efforts to curtail wind generation on those nights where there's a lot of you know, animals in the air uh, moving about. And it tends to be only a couple nights of the year that, that you know, that it causes a disruption. So it, it doesn't have no impact. It also doesn't have a, a significant impact on birds. 
Um, and, and there are ways to mitigate that impact and make it even less than it is. All right, we'll do a couple more here since I'm mindful of your time, Larry. Um, uh, oh, oh um, could you tell us a little bit about um, just when the migration season is? Right. Sure. I mean, it's like a, it's, you know, it, it's similar to when birds are migrating that you, you can see by daytime, right? <laughs> like you can catch, not a lot of these birds are stopping down in Vermont, so you can catch them by day. Um, oftentimes the, you will encounter them uh, in nocturnal flight call form, uh, maybe right around or a little bit earlier than the first person encounters them on the ground. So, you know, with some species in particular, like grasshopper sparrow, they seem to show up you know, in flight calls weeks before that anybody actually sees them on the ground. But um, you know, the early season can start in March and April. You know, April, you can get a lot of waterfowl moving through. Um, and then you know, towards the end of April, you know, the sparrows and the hermit thrushes start to come in. Um, you know, killdeer, you know, I had a lot of killdeer in April, but they've really quieted down. Right now it's like Virginia rail week, um, just getting tons of Virginia rails every night. Um, and the warblers are really just like white-throated sparrow week also, like the white-throated sparrow wave just came in full force. Um, and we're sort of getting into warblers now. So I've, I've been hearing the first warblers and you know, I'm expecting there's gonna be a ton more warblers soon. And you know, much like migration on the ground, it's like second week of May, it's like the floodgates open. And pretty soon it's just going to be bombarded with everything. So um, it's going to be May is awesome. It's it's real exciting to to know what's what's about to come. And then yeah, you know, some of the last ones are like the cuckoos. You know, you might not get cuckoos till mid May, um, but then once you start getting them, you know, you'll have good numbers of them through mid June. Um, of course, yeah, you know, adjust based on your latitude. That was my personal experience here in Essex Junction. But um, and, and you know, based on where you are in the country, it'll vary. Um, it, it'll be interesting as we get more recordists in Vermont and are able to start making regional comparisons. So Richard and I compared between, you know, where I am and uh, where he is in Montpelier, just casually, you know, <laughs> we're not doing any sort of scientific study, but we already sort of noticed some differences in, in the composition and abundance of birds on, on certain nights. And as more people do this, like, I, like sort of the answer to every question there <laughs> has been, there's, there's a lot more to learn. Well, thanks, Larry. Folks, I know there's a, a few more outstanding questions there that we're not going to get to, but I invite you um, to email me, Sean, S-E-A-N, at northbranchnaturecenter.org with any questions that you uh, still have burning desires about, and we'll make sure that Larry and I uh, get back to you with those if you're curious. Um, I'll have the, this recording up on our website in a couple of days, along with all the links. Um, thank you again to Green Mountain Audubon Society for putting this on uh, alongside us. And especially thank you to Larry for sharing with us uh, your wonderful expertise and your, your passion for birds and for science and for curiosity. Uh, well, thanks everyone for carving out a little time of your evening uh, to, to spend with me. And hopefully the next time we'll, we'll all be in the same room. Although, although, you know, one of the beautiful things is that we've been able to welcome people in from wherever they happen to be. So um, I'm really thrilled to do it and look forward to the next time. All right, good night everybody. Thank you.